Good evening, and welcome to your lecture on genus Homo, part 4, the Neanderthals. Uh, now, Neanderthals are probably my favorite fossil hominin species, and well, they're really uh, the favorite of a lot of people. Uh, this was, Neanderthals were the uh, first hominin species, or hominin group, uh, that were discovered as fossils back in the 1800s. Um, and their time on Earth uh, significantly overlapped with m the with modern humans, and s at least temporally, and possibly geographically. And so they've really excited the imagination of anthropologists and entertainers and the lay public uh, just for, well, almost we can say centuries. Well, two anyway. Uh, we could talk about and Neanderthals have been grouped um, on different levels and at different times, taxonomically speaking. Uh, and so we can talk about Neanderthals as a species, in which case they've been grouped as Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, we can talk about them as a subspecies, and they have been considered such as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Uh, and we can talk about them, we'll talk about them as a people. Um, you know, independent of their taxonomy, uh, they have been called Neanderthals or Neanderthals. And now, since I brought up those two terms there, uh, those two different pronunciations, you'll notice, I might as well go into that and discuss that briefly, a note on pronunciation. So, some people pronounce it, or call these individuals, call this group of, of Paleo hominins, Neanderthals, with a th there, and it's really a shortened form of their taxonomic term, Neanderthalensis. Uh, other people prefer the term Neanderthal, T-A-L, and this is from the German word Neanderthal, which is uh, means Neander Valley, basically. That T-A-L part is a suffix that means valley. And so this is favored by academics, and this is this was a type site. Uh, the first Neanderthal uh, fossil was found in uh, the Neander Valley of Germany. And so this is slightly favored by academics. The first one, Neanderthals, is generally favored by the lay public and used more in English dictionaries which is my preference. Really, I don't care. This is a stupid argument anyway. If any of you ever had an anthropology class before, which uh, from what I've read from your comments, a few of you had, it was probably drilled into that the quote, quote correct term is Neanderthal. Well, I'm not talking about a valley. I'm talking about a people. And I'm talking about a, sh and I'm using the short form of the uh, taxonomic term Neanderthalensis. So, um, I will use Neanderthal, and I don't care what pretty much anybody else uses. Um, they're, I mean, no matter which one you use, a listener, the pronunciations are not so far different that a listener can't tell what you mean. Um, if you are using, if you're saying Neanderthal for the TH, nobody would think you're talking about the valley in Germany. Nobody. And if you're using Neanderthal from the context, nobody would think you're talking about the valley in Germany. Uh, so really, the meanings are interchangeable. And even the people who pronounce it T-A-L, uh, they're not pronouncing it completely correct according to German pronunciation, as I understand it. One of my other undergraduates who was a German major told me it was Neanderthal, you know, very distinctly pronounced all the vowels. We don't do that in English. Um, and so really even that's a corruption of the German pronunciation for the valley. Um, now, and so if an anthropology undergraduate student tries to correct you, and you're using a THL, and that's the one you prefer to use, and somebody corrects you, tell them to get bent uh, and quit being so anal. If a professor corrects you, then, you know, you kind of go along with it, because when professors correct us, we just, you know, kind of suck it up. <laughs> but really, my preference is, I don't care. That's kind of the bottom line there. As I said, 
the first fossils related to these group of hominins was found in a place called Neander Valley in Germany. Uh, they're in the western portion of what is now the unified country of Germany. Um, and it was found back in 1856 in a rock quarry. Um, overall, the Neanderthal people, uh, so far as we can tell, based on uh, the fossil bone evidence, we're on Earth from about 130,000 to 24,000 years ago. Um, there are other sites that have Neanderthal-based uh, artifacts, um, but because other taxonomic groups used similar tools, we can't always conclusively date uh, those campsites or those sites to the Neanderthal uh, people. Um, but based on fossil bones only, uh, the dates here are 130 to 24,000 years ago, uh, and throughout the throughout Europe and throughout the and into the Middle East. Uh, so we are considering them in this course a subspecies of Homo sapiens, and so the uh, abbreviation there is, as you can see, H. S. Neanderthalensis. Um, they are known for having a long, uh, low cranium, kind of a blunt or very low forehead, but very uh, long in the anterior posterior direction. They are quite f famous, quite well known for having a wide and stocky body, uh, very short arms and legs. Uh, you can see on this and these pictures here, um, they have what's called an occipital bun. And you can see it better in some pictures than others. Uh, but what this kind of indicates is, what this term means, is that they had kind of extra space in the occipital area. That is the posterior portion of the cranium. Um, kind of larger and more filled out, more volume than in our own occipital bun. As you can see from the pictures, they had thicker... Uh, brow ridges, thicker than modern humans anyway. We might, con you might remember there, if you compare these to Heidelbergensis or even Homo erectus, you'll say that these are smaller, but again, uh, larger than modern humans. And look at the picture of the anterior view of the cranium, and you'll notice the nasal aperture, that is the cavity, the hole for the nose, uh, is quite large quite wide. I mean, it's almost as large as one of the orbits. Uh, furthermore, you can see that there's a fairly wide space between the orbits. And the result is they had very large frontal uh, sinuses. These are only a few, very few differences between uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. I'm going to mark out, I'm going to um, inform you about a few more notable differences. So overall, males were probably about five foot six, uh, but as I said, quite stocky and considered very muscular. They had very rugged atta muscle attachments on their bones, and probably about 170 pounds. The females were shorter, so there was some uh, sexual dimorphism there, smaller at five feet, but at five feet, they're probably 146 pounds. So um, it's a robust five feet. They were stout women. And with a brain of between 1,200 and 1,900 cc's, 1,900. Now recall that the average modern human brain size is about 1,300 to 1,350. So our modern average, our average is on the low end of the Neanderthal range. So for five feet to five foot six, they had brains that were about 20% larger than the modern human brain. They had, Neanderthals had the largest brain of all hominin species. And so, in one way, this kind of demolishes the myth. I mean, if we equate cranial capacity and brain size uh, with intelligence, we don't necessarily have to do that. We can at least say that they were very likely, probably as intelligent as we are today. Um, but if we to assume that we have the largest cranial capacity, 
the largest brain just because of how who we are and how intelligent we are, we would be wrong. Uh, and this is a myth that gets demolished here, is Neanderthals actually had the largest brain size uh, of any hominin species. So Neanderthals, when compared to uh, a modern human, we can see a Neanderthal skeleton there compared to a modern human skeleton. Uh, they were shorter, but more robust. They had a larger and more barrel chest uh, rib cage. They had short lower limbs, which means they probably weren't doing a whole lot of jogging and, and or sprinting. Um, but overall, I mean, top to bottom, head to toe, were more robust, more muscular than modern humans. Uh, even even their finger bones, amazingly enough, even their phalanges uh, show evidence of more rugged muscle attachments than we see in modern humans. But the question becomes, why? Why were they like this? Why were they so rugged, even though they were shorter? And of course, we can attribute this in great part uh, to the environment. Uh, so where were the Neanderthals living? Well, as I mentioned, they were fossils of Neanderthals have been found in sites throughout Europe. Uh, the type site is in Germany. However, uh, they've been found from the Iberian Peninsula uh, through France. A very famous site was found in Croatia. Uh, and as far and some notable sites in what is now Israel, uh, as well as northern Iraq. Uh, the site where it says Shanidar in the map, if you can see that, that's Iraq. Um, and the furthest east, um, so far confirmed and discussed, is Uzbekistan. A site labeled Tashik Tesh. Uh, that is modern-day Uzbekistan. Um, now, a friend of mine tells me that a member of her graduate committee, she's been in, in contact with a professor who is working in Siberia. Eastern Siberia at a site that looks like it has Neanderthal remains, but that is as yet untested and unpublished. Uh, but for the time being, what is established and what is conventional is uh, throughout, throughout Europe, uh, in the Middle East, as far south as Israel, and as far east as Uzbekistan. Uh, this does overlap uh, somewhat with the earlier species Heidelbergensis. If you recall, Heidelbergensis was uh, not only in Europe, but also started in Africa and in Southern Asia. Uh, so Neanderthals overlap with Heidelbergensis throughout Europe. And However, their range, Neanderthal range as far as Uzbekistan, I believe is further north, um, in the northeast of anything that, any place that Heidelbergensis went. Um, But that period they lived between 130,000 and 24,000, this is the upper Pleistocene, and this was a time um, that was dominated by glacial movements and ice age conditions. The features of the classic Neanderthal, and what we see here in this cranium held in the Frankfurt Horizontal Plane, uh, include, I can see there, you can start with the lack of a chin when compared to modern humans. Uh, now you might think that a chin is merely the uh, corner there, the, uh, the very anterior and uh, inferior portion of the mandible, but it's not simply that. The chin, if you think about this, is the portion of the mandible that um, protrudes more forward than the line of teeth, line of dentition, anterior dentition. Uh, so if we look at the Neanderthal here, we see a lack of a chin. A projecting mid-face, it's slightly more prognathic than modern humans. I already mentioned the large and arching brow ridges. A low forehead, but a very large cranial capacity. The one given here is upwards of 1750, but that's still within the um, range that I gave you earlier. Uh, this example here, this drawing, has a better example of the occipital bun. It is kind of that pointy portion in the occipital region of the cranium. And interestingly, they have a very large and oval-shaped foramen magnum. Uh, modern humans, the foramen magnum in modern humans is usually more round, more circular. Uh, they're both anterior displaced. However, the um, 
angle is somewhat different in Neanderthals because of this oval shape, a very distinct oval shape. Other features that you can't really see in this in this sketch include a very large nasal sinus, uh, a large infraorbital foramen. If you if you can you can see it there in the drawing. Uh, if you recall, a foramen is any uh, kind of hole that goes into a bone so that blood vessels and nerves can enter and exit. Um, and the one that in the infraorbital means inferior to the orbit. So you can kind of see the hole right there, inferior to the orbit, and it's. To, and it's noticeably larger than the modern humans. Overall, they are a short and robust species. And if you recall those Bergman's and Allen's rules from the first section that talked about body size and climate, um, we would we conclude that the Neanderthals were very well adapted to cold climates. Um, it's thought that the nose, the large Neanderthal nose, transforms the air that's that's inhaled um, the bitter cold glacial air and warms it and humidifies it before it reaches the um, throat and lungs. A large infraorbital foramen means that a larger blood vessels uh, can reach the face. Um, if anybody has ever lived in a very cold climate or has ever been to winter conditions, you've probably been told that uh, your cheeks your cheeks and nose are a special danger of becoming frostbitten. Uh, so the Neanderthals have these large infraorbital foramen, which means they could pump more blood uh, to that area of the face that is at risk for frostbite. And a short, robust uh, body means that there is uh, less surface area to volume. In addition, there are other, uh, many, I should say many other features. I mean, I can talk about um, a very peculiar bone spur in the nasal cavity. Um, in the past, some anthropologists have, have insisted that Neanderthals are nothing more, uh, not even a subspecies. Some have gone so far as to say that Neanderthals are the same as modern humans, just a difference in variation that we don't see on Earth anymore. Um, other anthropologists who are more focused on details will point out, say, a nasal spur, uh, this bone that's inside a nasal cavity that is completely derived. No other hominid species, including modern humans, has this bone spur in the nasal cavity. Now, what function it has, I have not even heard a hint of a hypothesis. But the Neanderthals had it. Uh, Nothing else had it. Homo heidelbergensis didn't have it. Erectus didn't have it. Modern Homo sapiens. Uh, so this this is good evidence. And other things, such as the very oval-shaped foramen magnum, the occipital bun, these are derived features that are very good indicators that Neanderthals were a separate taxon. Uh, but we have more than that. We can go into more detail. This is an image of Neanderthal molars. Uh, the one on the right is the occlusal view. You probably recognize of a molar. And on the left is a computer-generated version of it. The enamel is kind of in a, a halo, and you can see underneath it. And Neanderthals have what have been called taradont molars, or taradontism. Uh, this is derived from the Latin word taurus, uh, meaning cow or bull. So if you look at the picture on the left, notice that the roots of the molar are completely fused. Okay, and if you look at the drawing on the top right, uh, what humans have is, you can see the normal one on the left, it's called cynodont. We have very distinct roots and they're very separate. Um, and if you look in different stages until the right, you have hypertaradont. And so occasionally, humans have this condition, especially when it comes to wisdom teeth. The wisdom teeth are kind of crowded in there, and the roots fuse. Uh, as far as the other molars in your mouth, most of them have very distinct roots, and they're very separate. Now, with Neanderthals, they were all taradont style. Uh, and the reason they were named for bulls or cows, what, the reason they're called taradont is because uh, bulls and 
Well, cat, the teeth of cattle, the teeth of horses, and the teeth of other herbivores usually have very long fused molars. Um, and so whoever first looked at this, whatever anatomy, um, anatomist, or doctor of anatomy looked at this, uh, they, these tooth roots reminded him of the teeth of cattle. And so he called this feature taradont molars. So while humans only occasionally have this feature, it's a, all Neanderthals have these roots. In addition, Neanderthals have other features on the occlusal surface. And so if you look at the bottom right, whereas any one of those cusps and furrows and kind of wrinkles you see there are very derived from Neanderthals, one I'll point out in particular is the mid trigonid crest. And that's where the white arrow is pointing to. It's just a little ridge of enamel stretching from one cusp to the other in kind of a horizontal fashion in the coronal plane, if you remember what that is. Uh, the white arrow in the computer drawing there in B is also pointing to a mid trigonid crest. Now, no human has these that we've seen. No human population has these. These are, this is a completely derived feature of Neanderthals. So it's not just things like um, the shape of a, of a cranium or, the, or a lack of a chin, but there are very, very finite features of Neanderthals that separates them out taxonomically. Um, and there are anthropologists that spend a great deal of time studying such nuanced features. And one of them is Dr. Gortelli Steinberg here of the Ohio State University Department of Anthropology. Uh, but let's move on to some other features. So among the derived traits, I've already talked about many in the cranium, and there are still other details I'm not talking about, but we've reached enough for now, uh, and features of teeth, not just the molars. Uh, but I can also talk about other postcranial remains, such as the curved radius. And so here I present a, a comparison of a Neanderthal radius and a modern human radius. And you can see that the Neanderthal radius is much more curved. There is some variation in the curvature of a modern human radius. I can say that except for pathological specimens, such as humans suffering from achondropla achondroplasia or um, uh, a few other pathological conditions, I've never seen a typical human with a, a curvature in the radius like this. This is this would be highly unusual. This would be something uh, um, like related to we would think if I was to see this among modern humans or a doctor was to see this in an X-ray, he would think the individual was suffering osteomalacia or rickets or some other um, uh, pathological condition. But for Neanderthals, this curvature in the radius was quite normal. Uh, we're not quite sure what this means for them. It could mean that they had just greater forearm strength. It could mean they had greater throwing strength. It could be they didn't have to rely on something like a bow and arrow. They could throw a spear or a javelin much further and with much more force than we can. And this is a rough sketch. Uh, to take the comparison a bit further, this is a rough sketch comparing the uh, modern human cranium with the um, Neanderthal cranium. And we can see that while the modern human was a bit taller, uh, and so we have to figure that we have more developed frontal or parietal lobes of the brain. Um, they had more volume in the occipital area. And so it also begs the question of uh, did they think or did they perceive the environment around them with uh, more or less clarity? Uh, were their senses more acute? And it's possible that they did perceive or their hearing or their sense of smell was even better than uh, was better than modern humans. Now, as I said, uh, Neanderthals, Neanderthal skeletal remains have been found in Europe for uh, over a hundred, spanning over a hundred thousand year period. Uh, the oldest site is a place called Kropina in Croatia, and dated to 130,000 years ago. Uh, the remains there are very fragmented, but include some teeth, which are always valuable. In addition, the evidence at Kropina showed cut marks uh, at several places, 
which invites the hypothesis on cannibalism. So were people there, were the Neanderthals there at 130,000 years ago, were they in some kind of uh, very dire condition um, that necessi necessitated cannibalism? Or was this part of their ritual? Was it some kind of religious uh, function in, in which it was an honor to consume portions or all of their family members? And there are human cultures in which this happens. Um, so there are different kinds of cannibalism. I mean, there's a kind where... Uh, you might be thinking about first and foremost is such as survival cannibalism. It's not normally done in your society or in your culture. It's not uh, normally acceptable. However, you're in a dangerous situation. You're in danger of starving to death and somebody in your group dies and you cannibalize portion of them to live. That's one kind. Another kind is say um, in-group cannibalism. It becomes part of your religious function. So somebody dies and to keep their spirit with you, you want to consume a portion of them. Um, or to do them honor, you consume a portion of them. You throw away portions of people you don't like, but you want to consume pe the portion of people you do like. And that's been in the cultures of uh, several South American native groups, including the Yanomamo, uh, but also the Celts of the British Islands uh, also would consume members of their family, or portions of members of their family anyway. Uh, then there's the trophy cannibalism, and that was when you uh, killed your enemy and you decided to eat some portion of them. This was more common among, uh, say, Aztecs of Mexico um, and certain headhunter groups. Now, we don't know what happened here among the Neanderthals. It may have been survival and desperation circumstances, or it may have been a small group that practiced either consuming the enemy or consuming friends. Uh, we just don't have that much information there. Another famous site is called Le Chapelle au Saint, uh, dated to about 60,000 years ago. This is in central Fr uh, France. This was found way back early in 1908. And we find a tomb, a, ne a, tomb, a Neanderthal tomb in a cave. And bodies are found in a sleeping position, quote, sleeping position, or what's also been called a fetal position. And accompanying the graves will also be Mysterian tools and animal bones. And the skeleton called La Chapelle Saint Number 1 had two teeth that were lost ante mortem and some broken bones and suffered arthritis, as you can see in this picture here on the left. Uh, we can tell when an individual loses bones long before death because the bone heals over, as you see in this mandible. So this also comes to the question of did they take care of their elderly? Um, and this is very early now. This is 1908. So this is before we found um, other finds that I mentioned, like Atapuerca or uh, even before Peking Man or anything like this. And so we have the idea that they took care of their elderly, they took care of their crippled, they took care of their um, people who were dying, and they took care of them even in death. They had some kind of funeral ritual. There was a culture there, and a, recogni a recognition that this individual uh, was sentient and had passed. Now, because it was 1908, it didn't really get out, and there wasn't any kind of really controversy over it. it it remained, knowledge of this of this tomb remained in the very highest levels of scientists and you can imagine almost the nobility of Europe. And so not a lot really came of this at that time. It was a curiosity, uh, but we'll revisit the idea of graves and talk about what it means uh, here in a few minutes. And as I said, Neanderthals have been found in the Middle East. You can see there uh, in what is now Israel. This lists several uh, famous sites. We'll be talking about Kafse, Skul, uh, Tabun, and Kibara. And so this is the furthest south Neanderthals ever got. It does not appear, there's no evidence they ever made it into Africa. Uh, it seems this is the furthest south that Neanderthals went. We also have a lot of uh, information from a very famous site called Shanadar Cave. 
uh, there in northern Iraq. This was dated to 45,000 years ago. Uh, and this was probably, uh, this was excavated, I believe, in the 1950s. Uh, and so there was a total of seven adults and three juveniles. And later a, a, a book was written by an American named Ralph Selecki. But, and I will come back to the subject of the individuals from Shanadar Cave here in a moment. I just want to bring up a few of the more famous sites associated with Neanderthals. But Shanadar Cave had one individual in particular, uh, Shanadar number one, had a number of healed fractures across his skeleton. He had severe arthritis, uh, and he had an atrophied arm that uh, may have been, seemed to have been amputated by accident. Now, if you look down there, um, so if you look at the photographs there next to the drawing of the body, this shows a cranium of Shanadar 1. It may not become really apparent, but the right side is a little bit different from the left side. It's kind of caved in. And so this looks like uh, the zygomatic bone, and among other bones, it's probably fractured. Uh, in addition, we see very worn down teeth there in the middle picture. Uh, in the bottom picture, you see two humeri. And while the left one's complete and whole, uh, the right one appears to have been amputated, not surgically amputated, but amputated due to some kind of accident and atrophied. And so the um, totality of all his different injuries, and all of them notice on the right side, well, I mentioned the ones in the cranium and the, and the right humerus have been fractured, and so there's been a hypothesis that he was possibly the victim of a cave-in, and that he was uh, severely injured during a cave-in, that the members of his group pulled him out and cared for him. And it's been... Paleopathologists have examined the fractures in the right side of the cranium, including the uh, zygomatic, and concluded that he would have most likely been um, blind in the right eye. So he's blind in one eye, he's missing an arm, uh, and yet the people of his group had dragged him out from this situation and cared for him until he healed. And he survived, it appears, long, long after all of his fractures healed. So he was a non-contributing member of the social group. And even so, the arthritis was at such a level that it would have been difficult for him to travel. So his group had to stay in one place or had to help him move if they had to move to, you know, a different camp. Um, and so this invites a whole new level of, of care for the both elderly and, as I said, other non-contributing members of the group. He had to have been respected. They had to want him to live either for his knowledge, for his personality. It could have been uh, he had enough experience to pass on to the younger members, to the younger uh, males of his, of his group. He could have had the group history. He could have been had herb lore, uh, knowledge of the area, the land, and the animals, that, that the group found him valuable enough for whatever reason that they contributed to his survival into uh, advanced age. And so it was really this site, this Shanadar site, that because it occurred so late, as I said, in the 1950s, and uh, a book came out about it that really stirred up the world and got, once again, the curiosity of the lay public involved in, in finding out more about Neanderthal history. Uh, but let's go on more and see what we can talk about as far as our culture. Neanderthals used the Mosterian tool complex. Uh, the Mosterian tools have been dated from between 300,000 years ago up until 30,000 years ago. Uh, they did not use hand axes so often. Um, they used flakes and other pieces that they, that they carved over and over again. They had a stone core from which they could t use as a raw material from which you could take other points or flakes as we see in this picture on the right. Um, 
So the issue here is, like I said, Mousterian tools have been dated to 300,000 years ago. And so for a long time in the 20th century, if you look at older books, it will sometimes date Neanderthals to 300,000 years ago, uh, even though bones only go back 130,000. That was because Mousterian tools were simply associated with Neanderthals. So any site you found that had Mousterian tools but no bones were still attributed to Neanderthals. It wasn't until the 1990s or early 2000s that Mousterian tools were found in association with Heidelbergensis. Uh, and so any site that was found with Mousterian tools but no bones was then kind of thrown in doubt. You had to look for other evidence to figure out whether it was a Neanderthal site or a Heidelbergensis site. Um, and I noticed textbooks did a very quiet, very subtle shift in their dates. There was no big announcement. Um, kind of amusing for me, I suppose. But like I said, uh, the Mysterian tools date to about 300,000 years ago, so there was some uh, overlap between Heidelbergensis and uh, Neanderthals. But we know that these uh, Mousterian tools were used for hunting and possibly scavenging purposes. Um, they're having analysis, uh, analyses of Neanderthal uh, bones using stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analysis. And the conclusions on these studies that there was high amounts of meat. The Neanderthal's diet um, was probably mostly meat, if not mostly, at least a really high percentage of their diet was meat. What other evidence do we have as far as hunting? Well, evidence of spears, uh, evidence that the stone tools they made were, were, were intended to be hafted. H-A-F-T-E-D, that means to mount on a uh, stick, as you see in the picture on the right. Uh, so you have a spear in that picture on the right, and the stone point is hafted. And there was evidence of, there's plenty of evidence of large mammal bones, uh, such as mammoths, with cut marks and with evidence that they were butchered and with evidence of um, stone uh, cut marks due to stone tools. Now, because they had hunts, and they had to have very organized hunting on a mammoth, okay? It's not going to be like a cartoon or like a TV or anything like this or like your idea that you're going to have any kind of good success at hunting a mammoth. I mean, these were the largest mammals at the time, and not the largest mammals in history, but definitely larger than any land mammal we have today. So these things were huge. And you're going to use spears to take one down. You're going to get all your buddies with you. And to do that, you're going to need some coordination. So this is the first. The idea of hunting uh, and evidence for hunting was some of the earliest evidence that invited the possibility that they had language or some other form of communication. Now, it couldn't. it's possible that they did not hunt simply by using spears. I mean, we like to think of that as the best way. Um, and certainly it's a very uh, kind of glorious way to do it. It takes a lot of guts to run up to a big, huge, hairy, tusk-wielding beast like that with a rock on a stick and say, hey, I'm going to take you, I'm going to eat you for dinner. Um, but there's a possibility they use other methods than just weapons and just spears. There is a possibility that they drove say a herd or at least one or one mammoth or m an entire herd over a cliff and so we have found masses of bones um in pit situations that invites the possibility that they did what they could they did what they could to drive a herd of mammoths or other large mammals off the side of a cliff now do human have human cultures do this well yes uh, the picture I put up here is a painting of Native Americans driving bison off a cliff. Um, and this was a favorite method of hunting before Native Americans gained the horse. Uh, so in prehistoric times, Native Americans, a Native American tribe would, would find a herd of bison on the plains 
and they would kind of organize the route from the herd to a cliff. And they would do something like start a fire in a field, which would get all the bison spooked and running. Uh, and along the way, they would position people that would either start fires, like campfires, bonfires, or they would rave blankets or make noise or do something else. And once a, a herd of bison gets started, I mean, I would not want to stand in its way. But you can keep that kind of spooked mentality going uh, by creating a lot of noise and creating more fire. And so they would kind of steer a herd of bison until it simply ran off the end of a cliff. I mean, once the first ones went over, and there was a whole herd of them behind, uh, that you couldn't stop the momentum. And so there's really good evidence that they would drive an entire herd of bison off a cliff. And once they did that, there was a couple different methods they would use. In some cases, we have evidence that Native Americans would say, um, butcher two or three bison completely and leave the rest of the herd to rot. I mean, they took the skin and all the meat they could and just cut up all the, all the animal and take it back. But only two or three or four animals, whatever it took to feed the tribe. Um, and the rest could just sit there. On the other hand, there was evidence that they may have uh, taken select portions of many bison. So if they figured out they liked the filet mignon of bison, they would go to, say, every bison and take the filet mignon and leave the rest of the carcass to rot. Um, so when you hear the when you have the idea that Native Americans were in tune with the environment and in harmony and used all parts of the animal, remember that's a kind of a myth uh, that was created to... Well, I'm not sure what the purpose was. Uh, but it was created probably in the mid-20th century um, as a sort of... one of those periods when we go back and forth on, on history and how to interpret it. Uh, so Native Americans did do this, and, it's, and it looks like Neanderthals may have done something similar. In addition, now when we say that they had a heavy meat diet, I will say that uh, there is strong evidence that they had uh, some vegetable material. And I read an article recently that said um, because they lived in a highly glacial environment and actual vegetables and actual edible fruits and uh, vegetable materials was kind of rare, there is the possibility that, well, let me put it this way. Somebody decided to look at the furrows of the teeth and dig out those phytoliths. If you remember, phytolith means stone plant, right? Or phyto means plant and lith means stone. And take out those phytoliths and take a look at them under a microscope. And they thought there was something strange about them, the plant material, the fossil plant material, didn't look quite right. And so there's the going hypothesis now that uh, after in some cases, at least, when a Neanderthal killed a mammoth or a woolly rhinoceros or an elk, that part of his diet was cutting open the stomach and eating the contents. Eh? How'd you like that for your salad? I mean, you got just you got a big hunk of mammoth shoulder, and for a side dish, you have partially digested grass. Eh? And so, there was a couple of reasons for this. This gave them vitamin C and other uh, nutrients and vitamins that they need from vegetables that may not have been very accessible on the glacial environment. And because grass is so difficult to digest, they're taking advantage of they're taking advantage of the mammoth or they're taking advantage of whatever they kill by eating something that's already partially digested. Now, do other do do we find this in other cultures? Yes. Um, the Inuit of northern Alaska and northern Canada occasionally will, as I understand it, have read, uh, now, occasionally now or in the past, will eat the contents of seal stomachs and other uh, animals that they hunt. So there is a precedent for this, at least in human cultures. Yummy. So, Moving on, I mentioned the possibility of language when it came to hunting. Uh, is there evidence of language? Well, if you look on the left, the human hy the top picture shows a human hyoid bone, a modern human hyoid bone, and the bottom left is 
the hyoid bone from a Neanderthal at uh, Kebara in Israel. And so the hyoid bone is very similar to the hyoid bone of modern humans. Uh, so this does present evidence of speech, of the capacity for spoken language. Uh, we can't say for sure they had it, but at this point we might say they probably had the capacity for it. Um, I'll devote more time to this subject in a later lecture uh, when I look at the evolution of spoken language. And it seems like we had intentional burials. Uh, the graves are oval-shaped. There is definite evidence that they were deliberately dug for the purpose of burying a body. It wasn't an accident. Um, there are oval graves found in France, Iraq, and Uzbekistan. There is evidence of offerings that went along with the body. Um, pollen, which hints that there were flowers intentionally added to the graves. Uh, lithics, meaning uh, stone arrowheads or spear points, and animal remains. And so this all hints at the idea that there were grave offerings for the person to take into the a to an afterlife. And as these skeletons were found in the flexed position, the fully flexed position, hip, knee, elbow, joints, they were all flexed, what you might call the fetal position. In, in our, notably, in Iraq, uh, the grave was found with a uh, number of pollen grains that it was unlikely that they that the flowers could have gotten through any other method even though other hypotheses have been presented uh, in Uzbekistan a grave was found with the horns of wild goats as well as lithics lithics means stone instrument so uh, blades knife blades arrowheads or spearheads uh, in La Chapelle Sainte in France the burial was found with a bison leg and as well as lithics. Uh, so it does look like there was some kind of sentient understanding. It was some kind of conscience. And when this was brought about in the 1950s, it was very controversial, uh, this idea that culture could have been in some kind of lowly, quote, unquote, caveman. Um, there are many Christian groups that believe that culture and intelligence and compassion and uh, was only the, the provenience, was only the prerogative of modern humans. It was some kind of uh, divinely inspired prerogative on our part. Um, so this was some kind of controversy during the 1960s and even in the 1970s. Well, we have other evidence of culture. On the right there, if you see that, uh, we do have, that looks like that is a uh, depiction of a Neanderthal shelter uh, from tree branches, and we have very good evidence that they uh, made shelters. They didn't necessarily just live in caves, but they lived outside and elsewhere. Um, and then on the left, we have evidence of hearths as well. Uh, a, hearth, a hearth is basically a long-term fireplace or a campfire. Uh, and so when archaeologists dig into a living area, whether it's Native American or Neanderthal or some other culture, you can actually see where the soil has been burnt. The, the soil changes uh, due to contact with fire, and it's called thermal or heat alteration. Uh, and you can see that the stones have been altered, they've cracked, and you can see uh, how big the area was. And so we understand how big um, of a fireplace was needed for a family to keep warm and to cook and whatever. Uh, and so we find this this idea of the evidence of a hearth in Neanderthal sites. We also have the Divye Babe flute, as you can see there. The, and I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, the Divye Babe flute was found in Slovenia and stated to 43,000 years old, uh, and it was made from the femur of a cave bear. And so there you see, there's a depiction there of what a cave bear would have looked like next to uh, a modern human. That must have been one freaking big bear. Look at that thing. That's like the size of a buffalo. Bigger, maybe. I mean, the shoulder is higher than the shoulder of a human. So that means we're talking about a six foot, six and a half foot shoulder of a bear. 
that must have been a nasty mean bear when cornered. However, I have read that cave bears were almost completely vegetarian. They were all about the um, leaves and fruits and berries and honey and all that kind of stuff. But somebody 43,000 years ago collected up the femur, some Neanderthal collected up the femur of a cave bear. Uh, don't know if he killed the cave bear or not, but that would be one badass story if he did. Took the femur of the bear, uh, and carved it down, and put some holes in it, and made a flute. And so this is, this flute fragment is the oldest musical instrument known of from any hominin group. So yes, we do have definite uh, evidence that there was culture among Neanderthals. So we're going to put Neanderthals here. Uh, it seems in all likelihood that they evolved from Homo heidelbergensis. Now, if you recall, Homo heidelbergensis had spread out from Africa into Europe and Asia. Neanderthals, there is no evidence Neanderthals ever made it into Africa. This would mean that Neanderthals were the first hominin species to evolve outside of Africa. Everything else, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, everything else evolved in Africa first and then spread outward, if at all. In case of Homo habilis or Australopithecus, they never just spread out. But um, heidelbergensis and erectus evolved in Africa first. Floresiensis evolved out of erectus, but later neanderthals were the first to evolve in an environment that was not africa and they evolved and were highly adapted and specialized for living in a glacial environment but because they evolved from heidelberg basically heidelbergensis moved from africa out into europe and the heidelbergensis group in europe evolved in neanderthals whereas the heidelbergensis group in africa would have evolved into, it seems that, into modern humans. Neanderthals were what we might have been if we evolved under different circumstances. And so we're not quite done. We're going to talk about Neanderthals um, in probably one or two more lectures, at least. Uh, they're going to come back. So we're not quite done with Neanderthals yet, but for the moment, I'm going to look at the artistic reconstructions. This was the first, as I said, this was the first fossil spe hominin species that was discovered and has been, it has a great influence on uh, our culture. And we can see how our culture has influenced our depictions of Neanderthals over time. So let's go and look at the, the artistic reconstructions. This was the first artistic reconstruction based on the uh, Neanderthal type specimen and possibly others uh, and personally I think this is a very a very good reconstruct construction uh, the chin is blunted the face is slightly prognathic you can see a brow ridge uh, there's nothing too exaggerated here at most maybe we, you know, we, don't, we don't know about the facial hair we don't know how much of a beard he had uh, but nothing over the top and so I feel like this is probably a really great, accurate reconstruction. Now, after this, though, popular culture and entertainment kind of get a hold of Neanderthal. And so on the left, we have uh, something from the 1800s, kind of sensationalistic, and showing the Neanderthal more is this really great, hairy, savage beast. Uh, and on the right is a... B movie horror movie from uh, 1950s it looks like Neanderthal the, the Neanderthal man <laughs> half man half beast what happened um, and so again we're looking at the great hairy savage kind of appearance the brute caveman and I'll probably say that this is probably where we get our image of quote cavemen. Uh, later in the 20th century, we try to look at Neanderthals more based on evidence. Um, and so we do have evidence that they 
hunted large mammals using pit traps. I, I mentioned the cliff, you know, getting mammals to go over a cliff earlier, uh, but there is good evidence they use pit traps. The image on the left is based on um, a fossil site in uh, Great Britain, and it shows Neanderthals trapping a woolly rhinoceros. Uh, so you would dig a great big deep pit, you would line the bottom of it with wooden spears, kind of facing upward. Uh, the animal walks into it, impales himself, he's bleeding, confused, and injured, and they would move in with spears, or according to the picture on the right, with clubs, um, and then kill off the uh, animal they had trapped, and they could move in at leisure and uh, butcher it. Uh, and pit traps have been used in historical times, but usually for things like tigers or other fierce animals that you can't dispatch easily with your weapons. Uh, so this is kind of the image we had in the mid-late 20th century as kind of hunters in a very harsh environment. Kind of a Hobbesian view. And there's been a question often of would they fit in our society? And there have been some uh, people, some anthropologists, before the idea that they were not so different from modern humans that you couldn't tell them apart. And there have been some very serious attempts to show that they would blend in our society. I couldn't find those pictures uh, so much, but there have been attempts to, at, like, say, take a Neanderthal like this and then dress them up in modern clothing and say, oh, you, he would pass for a member of our modern society. Uh, this has been taken kind of to comic or com I should say comedic uh, extremes. So Neanderthals have been kind of fodder for comic relief. In I think the middle one is from the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, and set in that live skit, um, where he was a Neanderthal man, unfrozen, and became a lawyer or something. But nowadays, there is more of a movement toward seeing the Neanderthals as a people uh, independent of Homo sapiens, not trying to put them in our society or trying to explain them in our terms, but just trying to see them as a people with culture uh, based on the evidence that we've found. Um, and so I'm not sure where the one on the right comes from, where they're trying to portray the Neanderthals as very contemplative in this aspect, but the one on the left, I, I think, was sponsored by National Geographic. Uh, and again, trying to use evidence to try and put them forward as a people. So we say we have the older man here. Uh, this is the image of a Neanderthal as uh, developed by the Smithsonian. And here we have uh, two more images based on the National Geographic sponsored reconstructions of Neanderthals. Um, the woman on the left holding a spear, and the uh, Neanderthal child on the right. And the one on the right, I believe, is based specifically on a fossil set of remains called the Lepedo child, while uh, the woman on the left is supposed to represent um, the typical Neanderthal woman. As I said before, uh, as we understand it, a short and squat body adapted to the harsh glacial environment. Um, now I should add before we before we leave this subject, uh, you may have heard, uh, you may have read about the end of Neanderthals. You may have heard about different hypotheses, and uh, you may be uncertain of that. And not to worry, I have an entire lecture about, and a short lecture at that, so don't get too worried about the different hypotheses that uh, deal with the extinction of the Neanderthals and what became of them. And it has long been a subject of uh, controversy and mystery. As I said, these were the Neanderthal skeletal remains were the first fossil hominid remains ever discovered um, and recognized. Uh, so w their fate has really, really long perplexed and mystified uh, both the lay public and uh, anthropologists alike. But if you have any questions, uh, I think this is a great topic for discussion. Like I said, they are probably uh, my favorite paleohominin. They are the favorite hominin species of a lot of people, maybe yours now too. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to bring them up. But this is the end of this lecture.